These are called Stolpersteine. They were designed by an artist named Gunter Demnig, who took it upon himself in 1992 to go all over Europe and to install these brass cobblestones in front of the homes, the actual homes of families and people who were taken during the Holocaust and murdered. And these that you're looking at were in the Jewish ghetto in Rome. And each stone, if you look closely, will show the name of the person, when they were born, which camp they died in, or when they died. You know, it's not really an official memorial. You could walk by it and miss it if you weren't looking for it. But when you happen to look down and see these brass cobblestones gleaming in the sun, they catch your eye and you're like, oh my God, and you see a name there. And it has the same effect on you as a tombstone, except more because you realize you're standing in front of the house of somebody who was a victim of the Holocaust. There couldn't be anything more moving or a more fitting memorial to the victims of the Italian Holocaust than the Stolperstein, and I wanted you to know about it. But thank you for being here tonight. I wanted to talk tonight about, um, this is sort of, I wanted to kind of put a period at the end of this most important sentence about eternal, which is about what happened to the Jews of Italy, and particularly in Rome. And let's talk for a minute about justice. Because I mentioned last time that this is such a heart-wrenching thing because the Holocaust in Italy, unlike what happened in Germany, did not, there was no Nuremberg trials about it. We did not see people brought to justice and testify and testimony of victims and put in the dock and lawyers. There wasn't that due process for them. And I think I mentioned this in a previous video that I was actually, I asked that to one, an expert, a historian. And I said, why was there no Nuremberg? And he said, nobody wanted another Nuremberg. And I thought, ah, oh, that's wrong because these people were wronged and there needs to be justice for them. And the question that I had is, and those of you who read me and thank you for, because I know many of these names, um, I like to write about justice because I think it matters right and wrong. And does the law get you there or does it actually thwart justice? And what happens in war, like what happens in World War II and specifically in fascist Italy when the, war, when the laws themselves were unjust? That is a really awful and strange thing. It's not the first time it happened. It won't be the last time it happens. And I wanted to examine that. That's why the Stolpersteine are so interesting. That, and you saw the video before. I know it was a little slow motion. We slowed it down so you could actually see these. They're the brass cobblestones that are in the cobblestone walkways of Rome. Let me tell you about them, though, because it's really, really interesting. The Stolpersteiner is a German word. Now you're going, why is that? Well, what's interesting is that they were, they are not put there by some government or some Nuremberg type tribunal. This is not some governmental attempt to raise awareness. This is not officially sanctioned in any way. It began with an artist and his name was Gunter Demnig. Now let me show you the Sol Solperstein up close and then I'll explain what I'm talking about. Here is a picture of one if you can see it. It is in front of the home of the victim of the Holocaust. These are ones that I took pictures of in Rome. Now the dogs are gonna misbehave. I, this is the biggest one because you can see it up close. I'm gonna hold it better than I did last time. You said, it says, here lived, it's in front of the, the home, Benjamino Benjamin de Cori, born when he was born in 1879, arrested, 1944, deported to Auschwitz and murdered. It's really, really moving. I'll show you another one. I could, here's a picture of them in front of someone's home in the ghetto, the Jewish ghetto as it's called, in Rome. And Liz is saying, do you watch Stanley Tucci in Rome? Yes, I am loving that. And we're going to talk about all that fun stuff next week because I saw the episode in Rome filmed in, in the Jewish ghetto, right where these pictures were taken. Here's another one. Now here's one that is really important for our purposes. This is a picture I took of a Solperstein in front of a house. It was Costanza Sonino. Here's where she lived. Here lived, born 1909, arrested 10, 16, 1943. That is the event 
that is the really shocking true event that is detailed in Eternal. So I'm not going to tell you much more about it because it's really laid out in the book. And it's, a, it's really, really fascinating and a really horrifying but intriguing game of cat and mouse that the Nazis played with the Italians. But here is a brick from someone at that time, a sulfur sign, arrested, deported, Auschwitz, Ignota Morta. Not no, her death, her time of death was not known. Now here's what's interesting to me. Gunter Demnig, was a German artist. He's not affiliated with anybody. He just felt about, strongly about the Holocaust and he felt strongly that the victims needed to be remembered. And so in about 1990, he gets the idea that he wants to memorialize them in some way. And in 1996 in Berlin, he puts in the first Sulpersteine, which actually means stumbling block. And what it is, is a brass, it is a brass plate over a cobblestone. He puts the first one in. He puts the first one in without anybody's permission, kind of like Banksy. He's going to be a street artist and he is going to do the research and he is going to put these Solpersteine, which is the plural, in front of the houses of Nazi victims, the victims of the Nazis, the Jews of Germany. Now that's what he starts to do. And when you think about that, and what he does in the years after that, he gets bigger and bigger and people start to know them. They start to look around and people donate to him and he gets a foundation and they do the research, but it is an artist. There, it's, it's hard to get a definite number on how many there are of these Solpersteine and it's be, paused now for COVID, but he's still doing it. There are about 60,000 of these brass cobblestones that memorialize not victims of the Nazis all over Europe all over. People contribute. He does the research. He puts it out there in front of the person's home. And what I love about that is that it, it's interesting because when you cannot get justice from a government, from the law, from anybody who's supposed to be dispensing justice, there, where does it come from? And what do you get? What you get is the story. Somebody can tell the story. Who wants to tell the story? Well, first Gunter does. And when you look at these blocks and you think born, arrested, and died, every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Now, obviously there's a lot more to the middle of these stories. That's what I tried to bring out in Eternal. But the truth is, doesn't it remind you, I know that I'm not the only person who reads obituaries. If you read obituaries, tell me now, I bet you do. Now it's so heartbreaking. It's so heartbreaking to see these, but I've always read them because I don't view them as a story of someone's death. I view them as a story of someone's life, their life story. I think he does too. Every single one of these is a little life story of a victim in front of their house. When you walk by these, I don't think it could be more moving. I don't think you need to have a lot of detail. Oh, here's a picture of Gunter Demnig. What a little cutie. And all you need is to say, this is where this person's lived. This was their name. Remember we talked about the memorial last week? The name. The Nazis give you a number, but your name is restored. Your name is on those plaques. Your name is on these cobblestones. Your name is in eternal. But what really is cool to me is that when I wrote Eternal, I thought, I'm telling this story. It's fiction and it's about these love triangle and it's got love and all this stuff in it, but it also is the stuff of this history. It is partly based on this true event. And so I said, well, I want Elisabetta, the, her the heroine of this, to tell the story. And when I started to think about that, I'm gonna show you something I bought because I like to really do the research as you can tell, but I like to make it come to life for me. And I said, let's let Elisabetta want to be a storyteller. She wants to be a journalist. So I bought, can you see this? I bought the typewriter. I did the research. I said, what kind of typewriter would she have used at this time? Late 1930s Rome. What did they have? Well, this was it. You can do online and there's a place that has these old typewriters because also I wanted it to be realistic. For example, until I got this, I didn't know that the keys were white. Did you ever see a typewriter with white keys? I didn't. I didn't know how gleamy it was. I, I also didn't know how heavy it was. When I wanted to write it, you have to get the details right. 
Like I said before, that's why I went to Rome in October. I want to know what Rome looks like in October. Well, I want to know what this type of it sounds like. I also know that the keys get stuck when you do that. Well, probably if you type as badly as I do. Let's say Elizabeth types well. But I love this sound. I put this in Eternal too. I'll shut up a minute so you can hear. Doesn't sound like the typewriter I remember. And the keys get stuck. And what's so cool about this typewriter, which I also used in Eternal, is you see the name at the top, Olivetti. Very famous name if you know anything about office equipment. Um, my mom was a secretary. She had an Olivetti Selectric or something. Or that was IBM. But the bottom line is this. Olivetti is a famous, famous name. It's manufactured in Italy. And then I started to do the research of the Olivetti family because it's a family company. And you know what? They were devout anti-fascists. They did everything they can. They were there. They've been making typewriters all this time. 1935, 1937. She's the one from 1925. It was kind of expensive, so I didn't buy it. And I couldn't really justify it. But this was Elisabetta's, made by the famous anti-fascist family. I thought of Bob Dylan when I heard that, because remember he had a guitar and he wrote on it, this guitar fights fascists. And I get, this typewriter does too. And the truth is, just to sum this up, that I think a little, that I was inspired by that when I was writing it. I said, well, I'm going to write this story of a woman who's telling a story. And I'll show you one other thing, if I could just bear with me one minute, which is, this is a cool thing that happens that I never get tired of, but I, this is the actual manuscript of Eternal. And I love about that because you can see they number the lines. This is before, oh, it's the other side. Before, oh, how dumb am I? Before it becomes a book, this is what I get, and I proofread it, and you can see all the numbering of this story, and Elizabeth's story, and Gunter Demnig's story. And the real point I wanna make is this. You don't have to be an author to tell a story. You know that already. Anybody who spend any time in a ladies' room knows that because instantly women will start telling each other stories. And we, you'll tell stories about this night. And isn't it true that when you read a book, somebody will say, well, what's it about? And you find yourself telling the story of the story. Why? Because I think stories bring us closer together. We tell the stories that matter to us. We remember the stories that matter to us. And the one that matters the most is the story of our life. And that's why I really wanted to take the time to talk about those cobblestones tonight, those Stolpersina, because they are a story of life. Eternal is the story of a life told by me through Elisabetta. <laughs>